Do you wanna make your old countertops look new again? We're gonna show you in this video how we took wood and made them look like natural looking exotic stone. And best of all, you can do it yourself. Learn the secrets to realistic looking veins. Step by step, we'll show you how to template your countertop space. Also, learn the tips and tricks of how to create a drop edge and any router shape to create your own custom countertop. Learn how to make a unique, custom, amazing epoxy countertop. Visit our website anytime at StoneCoatCountertops.com and enjoy the video. All right, it's time to learn how to template. What we're gonna do is get a 1 8 piece of material. This is a 1 8 sheet of plywood. We picked it up at Home Depot for about 10 bucks. It really doesn't matter what it's made out of as long as the glue that you're using to glue your template material together will bite to whatever 1 8 sheet good that you purchase. What we're gonna do now is make this easily manageable to run through our table saw by first cutting it in half and then we're gonna rip it down into two inch strips. Let's get started. All right, we got our, our saw guide here. This is a great little tool that we use all the time and we simply snap the chalk line on a piece of plywood. We then screwed a straight edge. We just took a piece of plywood and screwed it down to the center of that plywood. And then we used our skill saw and we ran it down and we created a template. Now this will show and have a straight guide and a straight cut. It's basically a cheap panel saw. We're gonna use that to cut this sheet good in half and then we'll take it to our table saw. Let's get started. Here you go. All right, we got our 1 8 inch sheet of plywood ripped in half. Now I'm going to adjust my saw to two inch strips and we're going to adjust the blade. You don't want the blade too high because it'll kind of bind and grab sheet goods and act funny. So we'll just lower that blade a little bit and we'll get started ripping this down. Here we go. All right guys, let's go over our tool checklist. What do you need to remember to bring so that you can be fast, effective, and back in the truck and building your countertops right away? Here we go. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna bring our accelerator and our adhesive. Now you can use a hot glue gun in this case, a lot of people do, but in new construction, sometimes you don't have power or sometimes you don't wanna be tethered to that cord. This is our solution. I love this glue. We'll have this linked in the comments below. Also, you could find it on our Amazon links on our product page at stonecoatcountertops.com. The only things that we talk about like that are things that we truly believe in, and this is one of those flagship products that we can't live without. We're hooked on this stuff. It will, it will dry in 10 seconds. We hold that joint and we know that our template will not rattle apart on the way home going down that bumpy freeway. So in this we use 2P10 and we use the thick version. Gel also works but once you get into medium and thin versions it's too thin. Go with thick. That's our best or gel but thick is the best. Okay next thing you're gonna want. Oh I, also Bring your bucket. Your tool bucket is great because it also acts as a trash can so when you're on site you don't leave debris and cutoffs from your template. You throw it all back in your bucket because then you leave that job site perfectly clean and the difference between good and great is that much. Just put your trash in your bucket. So we got our adhesive, we got our trash bucket, we got our masking tape. We like to uh, bring masking tape in case we got to hold template material in a precarious position. You don't have to staple it or anything like that. You can use masking tape and hold it in place temporarily while you glue your templates up. Tape measure, critical. Don't forget the tape. All right, guys, your tape measure, it's critical. Don't forget your tape measure. That's important. Also, your knife. You want to put a brand new blade on that knife and that leads me to this template material. You're going to want to get a template material. We get as thin as possible. It's still going to stay together because then you don't need a chop saw or a saw. You simply razor cut it a couple of times and you get to do your template right in place without going back and forth to your saw. 
get your razor knife, brand new blade, have an extra blade or have a new blade where you can reverse it so that you're not uh, using a dull blade to cut that wood. Pencil's important and we like a Sharpie. The reason we use a Sharpie is because then we could label our template and we can make notes on that template that we need back in the shop. Is this buddy in a fridge? Is a buddy in a cabinet wall? Is this the center point of the sink? Is this a sheetrock wall? Is this tile? Are you gonna have trim here? Where's your setback? All those things are important. Finally, don't forget your speed square. We always bring a speed square because when we want to find the center point of the sink, you simply line that up with those two cabinet doors. It's going to show you right where that center point is and you put your uh, speed square there and you can trace that. It's also going to give you setbacks of, let's say you have an existing backsplash in place. You butt this to that existing backsplash, now you measure from the wall to your speed square and that shows you how thick that backsplash is. Speed square, imperative. Finally, some squeeze clamps. We like to bring squeeze clamps in case you gotta hold things in place temporarily. It's like having an extra hand. Uh, other forms of spring-loaded spree, uh, clamps, these kind of clamps, they're all good. We like the rubber because you're gonna have brand new cabinets in place a lot of times and you wanna protect that. So let's get started. We're gonna go to our job site. We're gonna show you how, how we template and we're gonna have some fun. Here we go. Welcome to our job site. The first thing we like to do is run our template material against our long walls first and the front edges that are the longest. We're gonna do that by scoring it a couple of times and then snapping that template material. We like to leave it a little bit shy so that we don't have pieces of template material overhanging where we don't want it. This process doesn't take long because of all the prep work that we've already done in our shop preparing that template material. Score that twice, snap it, and you're ready for the next piece. We follow the perimeter and we do the short ends last. That's what we're actually gonna glue to our long pieces. We're gonna use that 2P10 glue and accelerator, add a couple daubs of glue, a couple daubs of accelerator, hold it down for about 10 seconds, and voila, you have a joint that's not gonna come apart. We like to start on the big countertops first and then work our way to the little ones. Here I'm holding that front edge in place. I'll glue that last piece in place and then I'm gonna look for any gaps. Right here there's a gap at the wall. So I'm gonna use my cutoff pieces, my scrap pieces, to show myself exactly how tight I can get it to that wall. I'm just filling in pieces until that wall is snug. Here I'll lift up that back piece, we'll glue it a couple times, we'll shoot some accelerator upside down and then hold it there for 10 seconds. You see that gap there at the wall? Let's fill that in with some of our scrap pieces. On this particular job, we're not gonna have a lot of backsplash to cover those walls, so we wanted to make sure we're nice and tight to the wall. We're also gonna template the little piece that's adjacent to our large countertop. Now we're gonna use that visible Sharpie to put an X everywhere our front edge is. We're right in three quarters where the three quarter inch radiuses are going and sheetrock where that sheetrock wall is. Make all those notes in the field and when you get back to the shop, you won't have a guessing game. It's also real important to create an overhead drawing or a bird's eye view of your project. We do that and we'll go through and we'll make notes. We're gonna make notes on exactly what those measurements are just in case we wanna double check against our template and verify. And a half. This is a surefire way to ensure a great template. 58 and 13 sixteenths. Okay. We'll load our templates back in our truck. They're super strong because of that glue and we're ready to go. We know because of our template that one sheet of MDF won't be quite long enough for our particular countertop. We have a scrap piece of MDF that we're gonna to seam together to make sure it's big enough. Before we do that, we're gonna use some Tyvek tape and tape off the support boards so our quick coat doesn't stick to these boards when we seam our pieces together. Now we're gonna use our basket joiner to join these two pieces of MDF together. We'll measure one and a half inches and every six inches after that, and that's where we're gonna put our biscuits. We'll transfer this to our other board so that we get a perfect fit. We like to use a fresh sharp pencil here. It's always best to dry fit your work and make sure it lines up, look at that. Using some clamps to create stability and rigidity, we're gonna use our biscuit joiner and go right there on all of our reference marks so that we get great alignment with our biscuits. 
Again, we like to do this prior to cutting our countertop shape because it gives us some play. We just have to add some material on and then we'll trace it and cut it as one piece. It actually makes the process a lot more simple. Remember, blow off that final dust. Okay guys, our template was too big for one sheet of MDF, so we're gonna seam a scrap of MDF so that we have plenty of wood to work with so that when we trace our, our template, we already actually seamed it together. We're not trying to cut this wood perfect. We've oversized it and we'll trim it all as one piece and it makes your cuts seamless. Let's go ahead and glue this together. We're gonna use our quick coat. It's gonna dry fast and strong for us. And we've went ahead and gone with biscuits on this seam. The reason we did biscuits is because we went to pick up some dowels and the doggone dowels were out. So we're gonna use our biscuit joiner. We're gonna test this, but I really like the way that the biscuits are working as opposed to a dowel. The only downfall there is you gotta buy a biscuit joiner. You can get those cheap at Harbor Freight. We actually have a nice one from uh, Home Depot. It's a Makita, it works really well. Let's get started. All right, when using our quick coat, we're just gonna do a little batch at a one-to-one -one ratio. We'll mix it for two minutes, and then we're gonna take those biscuits, we'll dip them in that quick coat epoxy, and we'll put them in the slots. That way we know everything's gonna bite really well. We're gonna use the little piece of countertop that we're gonna seam together to pour the major part of the epoxy for our seam. We'll push it together, and we'll leave a little bit of a gap to pour a little more epoxy down the whole thing. Clamp it nice and tight, and scrape off the excess on the surface. And you have plenty of working time to release your clamp, scrape the excess, and put the clamp back on. You got about 15 minutes. It's good to see ooze out from underneath the countertop. Any products that we are using in this video, remember you can find them on our website, on our product page at stonecoatcountertops.com. Here we go. After about three hours, you're ready to unclamp your seam and you're ready for the next step. Let's put our template material on the long run of your MDF, we'll clamp it down and trace that template all the way around. Remember, we're adding an inch and a half overhang, so let's set our saw to one and a half inches and use a scrap piece of material to create an edge. Basically, this is what we're gonna butt against our template material and trace so that we get the perfect overhang. Look how easy that is. We know because we've taken notes and we've made a great template that this is gonna fit in the job just perfectly. This is the back side of our template where that wall was out a little bit and we added those pieces. We're tracing that and we know it's gonna fit great. I'm also transferring those X's to my template knowing these are edges and overhangs where the sheetrock and wall is. Everything's transferred to our actual MDF. And remember, here's our little piece. We'll fit that exactly where it can go on the MDF so we have zero weight. I love using rigid insulation board to hold my project so I can cut on it and know that it's fully supported. I also know that I won't hurt my table because it's sitting up on foam and nothing's gonna cut my table. We simply use 23 gauge pin nails to shoot our edge guide down and when you're done with your cut, open it up like a book and you can simply use your fingers and pop those nails right off and they'll be flush with that surface. This is a great trick when you come into a bind where it may be difficult to clamp. Using these simple methods, we know that our saw is going to get great cuts. We're also clamping and pinning it on the side of the material that if our saw were to wander, it's not going to hurt our finished countertop. Check that out. We're going to use a jigsaw to finish our cuts where we had on those inside corners, and that's no problem. We are going to make a small piece of backsplash for this job, but we're going to oversize it. We need three and a half inches, but we're cutting four and a half inches. And it's a good idea to pre-gauge your saw off that saw guide and go just a little bit below your MDF and you're going to have great finished cuts every time. This cutoff provided us a great strength test opportunity. We wanted to see how well that quick coat bit to that biscuit as well as that other piece of MDF. Show me. Now snap it right in half. Yeah, broke the biscuit. Let's see that again. Wow. 
Now we flipped our material over and we're sanding off the excess quick coat at the seam and we're gonna cut one inch strips out of MDF. We've preset that saw and we're gonna use that scrap MDF to create our drop edge. And this is simple to do. Just rip those strips down to one inch. We're gonna make a tracing all the way around the perimeter so that we know where to put our glue. Now it's time to make a point to point mark on our drop edge so that we know the angle to cut this MDF at. We preset that saw, we connected the dots, and it'll fit just perfect. We're gonna pre-glue that and use those 23 gauge pin nails to pin nail down our drop edge. You really wanna see that ooze out out of the front edge and just wipe up that excess with some shop rags. We're just gonna follow the perimeter wherever it requires edging and we'll follow the same process. It's simple, easy to do, have a great time. For this step, we like to use Tight Bond 2 wood glue. Make sure it oozes out that front edge and apply some to each butt joint, wherever it's going to butt another piece of MDF. We use 23 gauge pin nails at one and a quarter inches long. Wipe off the excess and you're ready for your next piece. And remember, we're woodworking, so you gotta have a good time. Alright guys, we're going to let our edges dry, let that wood glue set up, we'll come back, we'll sand those front edges so that our seam is totally hidden, and then we're ready to route our edges and pre-paint this, and it's time for the fun part, let's go! Got our laminated edge dry, that tight bond too dried really well, now it's time for the next step. We're going to take our 50 grit metal sanding disc anywhere there's lippage or where you could feel that seam where i pin nailed that together this is going to make short work of removing any of that lippage to give you a seamless front edge after we get rid of that we're going to finesse it and finish sand it with our random orbital sander i'm going to start with a rough grit at 60 grit and we'll work our way up to 220 grit it doesn't take long and you don't need to spend a bunch of time doing this but all that sanding makes a difference because your paint and primer in one will be very smooth and it makes the epoxy roll over that edge and lay out very smooth as well uh, also what we're going to do after we've done that is take our router bits and we're going to router a quarter inch round over on top and a one eighth inch round over on the bottom and this will draw the epoxy back underneath your project so you don't get a buildup or on that edge you won't get a little lip on there it'll pull around because of those router bits we'll show you what we're going to do right now stay tuned enjoy the ride let's go and remember, safety first. You're going to want to wear your mask and you're going to want to wear your ears. All right, let's do it. After our 50 grit metal sanding disc and our random orbital sanding is complete, it's time to router in your edge. We're going to start at the bottom, use that 1 8 inch round over bit, but test it on a scrap first. Here we're going to test it just to make sure it's lining up just perfect. Check that out. Follow that perimeter and voila! Wherever you don't have a finished edge, including the back of your countertop, use the random orbital sander and 220 grit just to ease that edge. It'll create less surface tension at the end. Here at the top of our counter, we're going to do a one quarter inch round over bit. We've tested it. Now it's time to run that perimeter. Just the same. Before we're finished up, we're going to blow the dust out of our seam just to make sure there's no lippage or openness in that seam. We're going to use our masking tape, mask off about a sixteenth of an inch away from that seam. We're going to fill it with 2P10 glue. We'll get that razor blade, we'll spread it out, we'll come back, and then we're going to use that accelerator to dry that glue instantly. After that glue is dry, use your random orbital sander and just sand it all flush. If you need a new disc, Put a new disc on it and you're ready to rock and roll. Let's get that all sanded up. After that, we're gonna use 220 grit on our random orbital sander. 
for one final sanding. This just prepares our MDF and gets it ready for a great job with our paint primer and wine. Be sure to sand those edges with 220 grit as well. This is going to give us a great edge before we even apply that paint primer in one. We're going to use our paint pyramids to support everything and keep it up off our table so it's easy to paint those edges. We're going to support our little piece as well as the backsplash with those paint pyramids. You can find those on our website at StoneCoatCountertops.com. We're going to use bare paint and primer in one in the color suede. We like to leave our weenie roller in that paint so we never have to clean it out and we're simply going to apply two coats and let each coat dry in between and sand in between coats. Let's do this. Now that our paint is dry and we're all sanded up, let's blow the dust off of that and we're ready to apply that second coat. All right, guys, we're ready for the next step. The paint and primer in one is all dry. We're gonna sand this with 220 grit. We made sure and got everything nice and level on our platform here. We use those paint pyramids to get everything up off the deck. We've leveled our tops and we're ready to apply the epoxy. Let's get started. We're gonna sand that second cone of paint and primer in one with our sanding backer and 220 grit sanding disc. This is an easy step, just be sure not to over sand and burn through your edges. Just keep it simple. Sand that dust and we're ready to go. Any backsplash piece that you're gonna use, just make sure you do the same treatment and the same effects on the whole project. If you've noticed, we've laid our countertop project up in the same manner that it's gonna be installed. Cause we're gonna do something really cool and carry a vein through both pieces. That's an advanced tip and trick that makes you look like a hero. Let's do it. A quick pro tip on any backsplash part of your project, just simply make it a little bit oversized. So we needed a three and a half inch piece. We made this all just over four inches so that when I'm done, I can just use my finished edge run it through the table saw and any drips that went over this edge are now cut off and I have a factory cut that's gonna sit perfectly true on my countertop project. Okay guys, time to get started with all of our color and what we're gonna do in this piece. It's actually gonna be quite advanced, but it's simple when you break it down into steps. First, we're gonna tint the epoxy with our gray base tint. What that's gonna do is make everything gray and we even have gray as the paint and primer in one. The reason we do that is because it may be a little thinner in those edges and if you see through the epoxy, you'll see through to a finished paint color and not just raw MDF. Also, that paint primer one seals that MDF to give you the perfect surface to put epoxy over. We've sanded that with 220 grit and now we're ready for that step. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our metallics mixed with 91% isopropyl alcohol and we're gonna mist those in the surface. That's gonna have a slight reaction with that base tinted color epoxy. That looks real cool. So we'll show you what that looks like, but we have clay, blue earth, deep silver, copper, ocean blue, white, and black. Those are all amazing colors that are gonna look good together, but that's all coming out of a fine mist spray bottle. We also have a heavy mist spray bottle. The reason we have that is because we're also gonna spray a little bit of black spray paint and then mist that heavy mist over it to fracture it. It'll look different than the fine mist. The next step we're gonna do is add veins with our spray paint. This is a really cool effect that looks different than the metallics, but they complement each other really well. Our customer has a couple paintings that are gonna be in their office that have some of these colors that we're integrating into their custom countertop and that doesn't get more 
custom than that. Okay, we're going to start with Seaside Brass, Lagoon, Chrome, Rustic Orange, Navy Blue, White, and Black. All those are going in that vein and wait till you see it. It's going to be amazing. Again, we're using our standard Stone Coat Countertop Epoxy. It's heat resistant, scratch resistant, zero VOC, user friendly, long working time, and second to none. Let's get started. We're going to mix a one to one ratio for two minutes using a drill and our mixing paddle. Mix about three ounces per square foot for each coat. That keeps it really simple. Now we're going to use our gray base tint. This recipe calls for that and we're just going to mix that for about another minute to make sure it's mixed in well and pour it right down the center of our project. The next step we're going to do is use our 1 8 by 1 8 square notch trowel. We'll spread our epoxy starting from the middle and working towards the edges and scrape all the excess epoxy back in the bucket after you've done the entire surface. Next, it's time to chop the surface. We're going to do this in a random manner, and we're also going to overlap our back edges as well as our front edges so that we don't leave any epoxy with surface tension. After we've chopped the entire surface, it's time to brush out those front edges. We like to use long horizontal strokes and just make sure you got epoxy on the entire face. We're going to do the backsplash in the same form and fashion. We'll trowel it out, we'll chop it, and we'll brush the perimeter edges. It's great practice to wipe off the excess epoxy before you use the torch. Look at how easily they torch right out. All right, guys, we've got everything troweled out, chopped, and torched. We're ready to spray our fine mist of all those metallic colors. Let's get started. The only secret to this step is just be random. We're going to use each of those colors that we had before mentioned, and we're going to spray those into the surface. You don't need too much. You don't need too little. Just play with it. Add whatever you want, and don't worry about it. This is just the beginning of a great process. Now it's time for the heavy mist. We're going to spray that black spray paint and then immediately hit it with that deep silver out of the heavy mist spray bottle. This is a great effect that we call granifying the surface. It gives a lot of organic texture to each piece. Now it's time to use the excess epoxy out of our bucket and lay out where our major vein is going to go. We're simply going to add spray paint to our paint stick and drag it through that epoxy. We're going to start laying those colors down, starting with white and black, and then we'll get onto our blues. It's going to be a great time. So when you're doing the veins here, you're just simply layering color on top of each other. I'm, I'm running the whole length of this, but we're going to come back with a glove and drag a glove through this. So this will grab a lot of those metallics. It'll add more spider veins. We're just going to keep layering color upon color, but we're putting the major vein down, taking a look at it and seeing what else we need to add. But this vein is going to go through both of these pieces. I always add white and black to whatever vein I'm doing. It just contrasts everything and makes it look more realistic. Always use white and black as your, as your vein accents. As you can see, I'm really taking my time. I don't have to be in a rush. I got all the working time that I need and I poured all this at the same time. I'm by myself and doing this project without worry of running out of working time. It's about 75 degrees right here in our studio and it is coming out phenomenal. Let's keep going. So what I'm doing now is I'm just going back to some of those colors that I really want to stand out. I'm going to layer them one more time and then I'll do my white and black and then I'll, I'll start to torch this vein to get it to move naturally. Okay guys, as, as you've noticed, I really haven't 
shown too much attention to outside of these veins for a while. I've layered color in these veins, but I've kept them real straight. I haven't taken my paint stick and wiggled it around. That's what the torch is for. It's going to pop those colors apart. It's going to move them. It's going to melt them. It's going to make them look realistic. Uh, just be careful. Touch and go. I'm going to get in there. I'm going to move that vein. And then as soon as it starts to move, release that torch or else you'll burn the epoxy. It's a little bit of practice. That's what practice boards really make perfect for, but we're going to go ahead and torch this vein out and I'm going to show you the difference of making a cool vein to a really cool vein. Here we go. So you can see I'm using that torch and I'm ballooning this vein out just a little bit so I don't have perfect edges. I want a fairly straight vein here just by the nature of this piece, but you can use that torch to shape your vein. You don't need to do that with the paint stick. And then when you put the lines in straight and you move it with the torch, they all move at the same rate. So it looks very natural like a rock sediment style ballooned out there in that different uh, layer of rock. It's, it's really a good effect. It looks real. All right, I'm gonna fog a little bit of dark blue. We want a little bit more blue showing as a tint. So a good trick to do that is just stand back and just fog your piece and it'll, it'll give it this appearance of high and low points, but it'll give it some blue throughout. Just don't get too close. It'll, it'll make it too blue really quickly. All right, what we're gonna do now is I'm just gonna do our glove technique. We're gonna use our glove and we're just gonna drag it through this surface and it'll grab these metallics and paints and it's just gonna move them on the surface to make them look natural and real. At first, it's gonna look weird. You're gonna go, oh no, I'm ruining it, but you're not. You're gonna skip some spots, leave some spots done. And then we'll even do that through our vein and we'll probably come back through that major vein and add more color, maybe even a little bit more epoxy. We'll see, here we go. It's a great idea to preheat the epoxy before you drag the glove through it and it'll grab those colors that are sitting on top and create a realistic fracture and vein. Here we are preheating and then we're making our fractured fault lines. Rub those edges out. Whatever you do to the surface, also due to that backsplash, this piece is starting to come together. Here we're using that torch to smooth out some of those fractured fault lines. Okay, I'm going to add a little bit more blues and uh, a few more veins, not just right down the center here. Not as big or as much time involved, but we're just going to add a few more just to, just to get this piece to kind of go together. Let's do it. I think I'm going to use a little bit of that, um, that seaside here, just a touch, just a touch. Oh, cool. Wow. That's really neat. That's just another contrast of blue there. I'm not going to add that everywhere, but just that splash of it. Goodness, that's cool. This is kind of my safe spot here because it's the back of the counter. Um, it's really where I could test things, and if I don't like it, I could hide more of it there. That's typically where I start. I think I almost do that, you know, subconsciously, just knowing that that's my escape plan right there in case I don't like it. Oh, yeah. This is great. Here we're going to use some more of that excess epoxy and just put in some different color veins. We're also going to drag a little bit of white, a little bit of blue, and just off the corner of that paint stick. Where's my white? Any perfect circles. If you see any circles, just use your finger, pull the material right over that circle and let it flow a little bit longer. It's gonna make your project look much more realistic. Step back, 
Check it out and see what you've created. Wow. Okay guys, we got the color coat all wrapped up. We actually just used some of the colors that are on some of these photos in this office where these countertops are gonna live. And this looks custom. Really cool, unique, nothing else is like it, and it looks very realistic. You look in this vein and you get lost. Talk about visual interest. I hope he could get work done because he's gonna be looking at his countertop in his office. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow. We're gonna come back, we're gonna do a clear coat, and then we're gonna sand and polish this and install it. Stay tuned, we'll be back tomorrow. Let's take one more look at how this piece evolved. Check that out. Okay, that color coat is dry. We're ready for the next step. It's been about 20 hours. It dried here in our shop and it's really good. It's ready to rock. So we're gonna do the edges first. We're gonna sand that with 220 grit by hand on the coves and we'll use our backer for the face of that edge. Then we'll come to the top and we'll do the top by hand. Now, all the scratch marks and all that stuff, it doesn't matter. It's gonna get totally hidden with our clear coat, which is the same stone coat countertop epoxy with no additives, just clear. Let's get started. This is simple. Let's go through the rundown real quick. We're going to use our same stone coat countertop epoxy, part A and part B at a one to one ratio. We're going to put part B in first and then part A and the measurement is easy. Three ounces per square foot. That's with each coat. Then what we're going to do is we're going to mix that with our drill for two minutes at full speed and then we'll slow that drill down and we'll rub the bottom and the edges of that bucket to scrape off anything that may not be mixed. Mix it a little longer and then it's time to pour it out right down the center of our project and what we're going to do is use that paint stick and we'll scrape the excess right into that bead of epoxy. Then we start to trowel it out with our 1 8 by 1 8 square notch trowel. Now we carry these products right there on our website at stonecoatcountertops.com. Okay, then we're gonna use our chop brush. After we've troweled it out, we're gonna chop it. Now why do we chop a clear coat the same that we chop a color coat? Great question. This is why. You're gonna mix it one, two, and three times. The first time in the bucket with the drill, second time with the trowel, and the third time with the brush. That way you ensure you will not get any sticky spots. That's really important when working with epoxy. Okay, and then finally, when you're ready to go, it's time for your torch. You're gonna to torch it three times. This will get your project crystal clear. It's important to wait a couple minutes. What we do is we'll start at one end of our project, we'll work our way through the project. By the time we get to this side, that side's ready to torch again. So we're gonna do that three times using those sweeping motions. Watch how we do it in the video. It'll give you a great idea, but practice makes perfect. You guys ready? Let's do this. Woo! Okay guys, that's all there is to that clear coat. That's a simple process. Just follow those easy steps and you'll get amazing results. This is laid out extremely flat. We're gonna bring that camera in close and show you some real good close-ups. Thanks for watching this video. If you have any questions, feel free to call us anytime for free project support. Uh, we love doing this process. This color came out phenomenal. Mitch and I were looking up close. I really like how we took that paint stick and just a little bit of paint and drug a quick little spider line through that. And it, it, even in that blue, it looks like turquoise is embedded in that and you could get those grain flows to all match. We got this vein going through this whole project. When we install this, it's gonna look phenomenal. We're gonna wait about four or five days and we'll bring you along in another video and show you just how easy it is to install this. To see that video, check in the description below. When we post that, we'll attach it to this one so that you can be sure to see how we install this and how fast that goes. 
Thanks again for watching. Visit our website anytime at StoneCoatCountertops.com. Make sure you subscribe to our website. We're putting up new content all the time. If you had good, good experience watching this video, give us a thumbs up. Let us know in the comments below what you would like to see in future videos. And until next time, until that future video, you got this from Stone Coat Countertops. Thanks for watching. Remember, when you subscribe to our channel, click on the red subscribe button and be sure to ring the bell so you get notified every time we have a new video. Thanks again.